Lord. Well, good morning. Uh, this hearing will come to order. Uh, I want to uh, welcome all our witnesses here today. And before I uh, make my opening remarks, I did want to tell uh, everybody who's gathered that uh, we've got a tight schedule this morning. I apologize in advance. Uh, we may be disrupted uh, 45 or 50 minutes into the hearing because we have a series of votes. Uh, but we'll move with some dispatch because we really do want to hear from uh, this distinguished panel. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting your views on an import this important issue of how best to ensure that NASA will have the workforce that it needs to accomplish its various uh, challenging missions. Uh, it's obvious that uh, NASA's workforce is critical to the success of its missions, and yet it should be equally obvious that the continued health and strength of NASA's workforce cannot be taken for granted. It needs to be nurtured, supported, and given the tools and resources it will need to carry out the complex and challenging missions that has been asked to undertake in science, aeronautics, and human spaceflight. That's why I'm keenly interested in hearing the findings and recommendations of the two recent independent assessments of NASA's workforce needs as well as the NASA's response to them. Uh, however, I envision today's hearing is only the first step in a continuing examination of the health of NASA's workforce by uh, our subcommittee. In particular, I hope to have a follow-on hearing later this year to examine some of the particular civil service and contractor workforce challenges that are associated with the upcoming retirement of the Space Shuttle. And in addition, I would like the subcommittee to review the proposed legislative provisions that have been provided to Congress by NASA to address some of these uh, workforce challenges. Thus, I hope that this hearing will be one in a series of hearings on this topic. We owe it to both the highly talented NASA employees as well as to the broad aerospace community to make sure NASA and Congress get it right in attempting to shape NASA's future workforce. Uh, as I've said, many others have acknowledged that uh, NASA's civil service workforce consists of some of this nation's best and brightest, and in most cases, uh, they've made a long-term commitment to public service. Uh, I respect them for that commitment, and I think that whatever workforce strategy NASA develops uh, should build on the strengths that these individuals bring to the agency. Because if those skills are discarded, whether for short-term budgetary reasons or for some other reason, we would find out at a later date that it's a difficult, if uh, not impossible, to recapture skills that the nation discovers it needs. And at the same time, uh, NASA must work to attract and properly utilize the young men and women who will provide the scientific, engineering, and project management expertise required for NASA's uh, future missions decades uh, into the future. Doing all of that would be a tall order under the best of circumstances, and it will be doubly difficult if NASA has not provided resources that are equal to the missions that it has been asked to undertake. Now, uh, I'm sure Judge Hall would agree with me that money alone will not ensure that NASA will have the strong and vital workforce that it needs, but insufficient funding will undercut whatever workforce initiatives are put in place. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about uh, today, and I want to... Uh, Again, welcome our witnesses, and I'm uh, at, at this time honored to uh, yield whatever time he deems necessary to my good friend, uh, Congressman Hall, the uh, ranking member of the entire committee. Judge Hall. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say I was honored to be sitting by a member of really a great American family and uh, one that's uh, been a, lived a life of public service. and. The guy's so dang handsome, I asked unanimous consent if I could sit down there. I didn't have to sit by him. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, Judge Hall, you're out of order. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, here I go. Uh, and I do thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this meeting because uh, I always like to welcome the witnesses and thank them for coming today because they are giving up their time. It takes time to get here. I think that I saw Mr. Stewart coming in this morning, and I thought he was Norm Augustine. I, I almost said, hello, Norm, how you doing? But, uh, uh, and Ms. Dossie, good to see you again, and welcome, and thank you. Uh, NASA has a unique and interesting set of missions, and all of us on this committee want you to successfully accomplish the missions that we've laid out. And I don't think we ought to give any on the program that's laid out. We ought to hold of what's laid out. We shouldn't have to take any suggestion that we're not in a good economy because that wouldn't be true. And uh, we don't need to start uh, uh, surrendering any of the gains that we've laid out and that the President's vision has set out and that we've accepted. We need just to carry it out and to follow it. 
and workforce is so important in that. Uh, everything that NASA does depends on its ability to maintain a really highly qualified and competent workforce. Developing the right mix of skills and keeping people engaged in the challenging work as budgets and program priorities change, I think, requires just a, a very continuing commitment, a commitment that I've noticed in NASA from the time I've been here. Uh, you face a, a number of workforce challenges over the next few years, including retiring the space shuttle in 2010 while simultaneously completing the International Space Station and developing the new Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle and Ares Launch System. NASA's uh, aeronautics program has been refocused, shifting away from technology uh, demonstrations and toward long-term basic research. NASA's vital science programs have uh, faced difficult changes as well. Furthermore, in addition to technical, scientific, and engineering challenges, the agency also faces daunting financial management challenges that it's been largely unable to address, in part because of a lack of qualified financial auditors and administrators, I'm told. Uh, these pressures are unlikely to go away. In fact, they'll almost certainly continue in the future. Things are always changing, and the nature of science and technology uh, but the workforce has to adapt to these changes, and the agency bears a responsibility to employees and to its stakeholders, including Congress, to develop a strategy to effectively address the changes. In April of 2006, NASA released its workforce strategy document as required by the NASA Authorization Act of 2005. The National Research Council and the National Academy of Public Administration have each reviewed uh, NASA's strategy and offered very thoughtful uh, perspectives on it. I look forward to hearing from, from them today, and I also look forward to hearing from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. Workforce is so vital to NASA's mission. NASA has to constantly evaluate its future needs and be ready to take uh, preemptive action when necessary to ensure the right people are there to do exciting and challenging missions and continue to accomplish extraordinary of scientific discoveries. I look forward to hearing from you today, from the witnesses. With that, I thank the chairman and yield back my time. Thank you, Judge Hall. Uh, at this point, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, so your statements will be added to the record and without objection, so ordered. Uh, at this time, I wanted to introduce uh, the panel of witnesses, and I'll introduce all of you, and then we'll start uh, on my left with Ms. Uh, Dossi and her testimony. But let me uh, welcome all of you again and, and uh, say a little bit about each one of you. Uh, Ms. Tony Dossi is the uh, NASA Assistant Administrator for Human Capital Management. Uh, Mr. John Stewart, uh, next in line, is a fellow at the National Academy of Public Administration, was a member of its uh, NASA multi-sector workforce panel. Dr. David Black uh, recently co-chaired the National Research Council's Committee on Meeting the Workforce Needs for the National Vision for Space Exploration. And we have uh, to his left uh, Dr. Lee Stone, the legislative representative from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers who serves on the NASA Council of IFP uh, TE Locals. Uh, welcome. I think um, most of you, are, if not all of you, are professionals at this. You've been in front of the committee and the subcommittee before, and you know you have uh, five minutes, uh, and then we'll uh, turn to questions so that uh, we can further uh, drill down into the expertise you have in your perspective. So, Ms. Dossie, the floor is yours for five minutes. Chairman Udall and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss NASA's workforce. Implementing the vision for space exploration clearly represents a great management challenge now and for many years to come. In particular, the retirement of the shuttle, the completion of the International Space Station, and the development of the multiple elements of the Constellation Program involve a daunting series of transitions, both programmatic and institutional. The NASA Workforce Strategy submitted to Congress in April 2006 laid the foundation for the actions the agency must take to maintain the knowledge base of the current workforce and to acquire the skills necessary to accomplish NASA's mission. The document articulates three principles underlying our workforce strategy building and sustaining 10 healthy centers, maximizing the use of NASA's people, and evolving to a more flexible, scalable workforce. We have devel developed a comprehensive plan based on these principles with three primary goals to implement them. The first goal is to understand mission requirements, both near and long term. 
The second goal is to align the skills of the workforce with mission needs. And the third goal is to enable more effective and efficient human resources operations through the delivery of comprehensive and authoritative workforce information. <clears throat> the first goal, understanding mission requirements, requires an especially strong workforce planning capability. Recognizing that it is critical that all levels of management be involved in workforce planning, in January, the agency established a workforce planning governance structure comprised of key agency managers to identify workforce risks and to develop joint solutions to issues as they emerge. We have also integrated workforce planning with the development of program and project budgets. With an enhanced workforce planning capability, NASA will be better able to determine the de demand for and supply of individual workforce skills. The second goal, to align the workforce with the mission, requires strengthening the technical and leadership excellence of our employees and reshaping the workforce to better serve future mission requirements. In addition, as more of our experienced employees reach retirement eligibility, it is imperative that we attract and develop new talent. To strengthen technical excellence, the agency is providing workforce retraining and skill development through a number of programs designed to develop program and project managers and engineers to transfer knowledge across NASA, academia, industry, and international partners, and to ensure that lessons learned are captured for the next generation. In order to build leadership then strength, NASA has created a corporate leadership framework that provides succession planning and executive development. Another challenge is to reshape the existing workforce to better serve current and future requirements. The use of buyout early out authority to encourage voluntary attrition has been critical to NASA workforce reshaping. Since the start of fiscal year 04, over 1,300 employees in targeted areas of surplus took buyouts or early outs. This is over one-third of the total attrition of 3,500 during this period. We continue to monitor this program to ensure that experienced employees with needed and critical skills are not leaving the agency and that safety of the space shuttle or the International Space Station is not compromised. To replace normal attrition, since 2004, we have hired nearly 2,500 employees. Of this number, 700 are recent college graduates. The tools provided by the next NASA Flexibility Act of 2004 continue to be vitally important to us as we reshape our workforce. They provide over a dozen tools that include enhanced recruitment, relocation, and retention bonuses, expanded use of term appointments, and benefits for new hires. In March, NASA submitted legislative proposals to provide the agency with additional flexibilities that it needs to better implement the transition from shuttle to constellation. To effectively manage change, NASA must leverage information technology also to provide more responsive, reliable information to support decision making. This is our third goal. NASA is working toward full integration of human resources information across the agency. NASA also is converge, converging business systems, expanding as, access throughout the agency, and increasing tools and applications. These efforts will form a human capital information environment that will, prov that will provide a foundation for total business systems integration and provide near real-time comprehensive information to enable and inform decision making at all levels. The initial operating capability for this environment is planned for the summer of 2007 with final implementation during the fall of 2008. In summary, in implementing the NASA workforce strategy, NASA is positioning itself to deal effectively with the critical issues now facing the agency on an integrated agency-wide basis. NASA is putting in place approaches that not only will alleviate the agency's current imbalances, but also will provide a structure that allows such issues to be resolved in the future as part of a deliberate, systematic process. 
The foundation that NASA is building is a big picture view that will facilitate and institutionalize long-term planning and agency-level coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dossi. Uh, Mr. Stewart, five minutes. Is I miss, Mr. Chairman, if I didn't say how much I admired your father and had a chance to work with him on occasion back in the old days, but a truly great, great public servant. If Personal I, note. I uh, would put Judge Hall in that same category uh, as a great public servant and uh, somebody who uh, has roots in that, that era, and uh, Judge Hall's helped uh, in his own way uh, keep that spirit alive. So, Mr. Chairman, you. would you yield? I would be happy to yield to my good friend from Texas. I knew Mo Udall, and I'm no Mo Udall. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, would say this, that uh, I learned more from Mo. I was, my first office was directly across from him back 27 years ago, and I learned more from him the first 30 days than I'd learned in the last 10 years in the Texas Senate. You, you, you're, you're out of order again twice in one day. So. Well, anyway. The floor Thank is you. yours, sir. I better get going here. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, Sally Ann Harper, our panel chair, very much wanted to present this testimony. She is the chief administrative officer at the uh, Government Accountability Office, and her duties there uh, this morning uh, made her appearance not possible, and so they had to go to the bench, and I'm here to, uh, to uh, stand in for Sally Ann Harper. Um, our panel had six major conclusions and recommendations. First, we said that NASA should make greater use of strategic planning mechanisms to position itself for programmatic and schedule changes. The agency needs to adopt a longer-range, risk-based planning strategy to anticipate and respond effectively to future program needs, budget shortfalls, and schedule revisions for its total multi-sector workforce. Despite declining overall budgets for aeronautics, as well as reductions in some scientific programs, NASA has retained most of its aeronautic and scientific workforce. Although many of these individuals can continue working on existing aeronautics and scientific programs or transition to new programs, it is unrealistic to expect that all will be able to do so. Essentially, NASA needs to determine the number and type of employees that would constitute a critical mass for its aeronautics and scientific responsibilities, as well as a critical mass to develop the various systems needed to achieve the vision for space exploration. Second, NASA must broaden its workforce planning to encompass its multi-sector workforce. The process should inventory the key components and skills available for both civil servants and contractor organizations, including the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In the, in the initial version of the uh, NASA workforce uh, uh, plan, it dealt solely with, with civil servants, and we felt that this was a mission that needed to be acted on. Third, NASA must integrate its acquisition and human capital planning processes. This is really important. Contracts provide surge and long-term support capacity, as well as the ability to shift people and competencies as the mission dictates. Now, NASA's made a good start at establishing a new acquisition process that begins with a strategic discussion of whether and how to contract for major programs and projects, but this should be further developed. Such integration will help NASA better understand the workforce implications of contracting decisions. And to help facilitate this process, the panel designed tools to help managers focus on critical common factors to consider in making civil service versus contractor decisions. Fourth, NASA should strengthen its human capital function and use a formal process to decide when to hire a permanent civil servant or a term employee. As one of NASA's most critical internal support capabilities, human capital needs to be a full participant in all agency decisions with important workforce implications, including high-level planning for the total workforce. And, and NASA is moving in that direction. Let me just interject. Good. And to be effective, human capital professionals must have the ability to identify skill mismatches, promote the effective use of existing flexibilities, and collaborate with others to craft other needed flexibilities. In addition, NASA needs to be more strategic in how to make civil service hiring and conversion decisions, and we have developed a tool to assist NASA decision-making in these areas. Fifth, 
The panel has concerns about the long-term health of NASA's research centers and believes that the agency should use a more comprehensive framework to evaluate them. The panel found NASA's approach to healthy centers to be people-focused, which, which to some degree is fine, but with an emphasis on fully funding civil servants. To assist NASA in this area, the panel developed a detailed 12-factor framework covering such areas as the center's mission, program performance, civil service, contractor workforce, and organizational structure. This framework should help NASA balance changing mission requirements and budget constraints. Sixth, NASA must make maximum use of existing human capital flexibilities while seeking new other authorizations for necessary reform. And, the, of course, the NASA Flexibility Act of 2004 gave NASA some flexibilities. They are being used, but not as fully as they could be, and we think there's some more that are needed. And more controversially, uh, and we know that's controversial, the panel believes that Congress should provide NASA with limited emergency authority to invoke a fully eligible individual's retirement to meet work restructuring needs if some or all of the following criteria are met. And we, and we list those criteria, and we can talk about them uh, in the question period. And um, I want to emphasize that these statutory recommendations that we're making cannot be implemented by NASA alone. They require action by Congress and OPM in the face of likely uh, political resistance. Uh, they, are some, they are controversial. And um, let me just say for the record, we understand that NASA understands the nature of this problem. It's taken some initial steps, and we've made some suggestions to help them um, move further down the right road. That concludes my prepared statement, and I, and I will answer questions when that time comes. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. And Dr. Black, the floor is yours. Chairman Udall, uh, Ranking Member Hall, and committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to testify for you today. I appear in my capacity as co-chair of the National Research Council's Committee on Issues Affecting the Future of the U.S. Space Science and Engineering Workforce. My co-chair of the NRC study, Professor Daniel Hastings, joins me today, and you can tell which one of us drew the short straw. Our committee found it useful to consider two distinct time frames when evaluating the NASA workforce as it relates to NASA's implementation of the vision for space exploration. Specifically, we looked at the next five years and then the time frame beyond 2012. I want to highlight three aspects of our committee's conclusions. First, in the view of our committee, NASA does not currently have the expertise needed in-house, particularly in the areas of systems engineering and project management, to implement the vision. Nor do we feel that any amount of training or retraining during this time frame will address fully the shortage of expertise. Second, we are confident that a well thought out and implemented training and hiring program will allow NASA to be well positioned in the post-2012 time frame to implement the vision. Third, the committee feels strongly that the issues NASA faces are not unique to NASA. They are at the heart of any assessment of the nation's aerospace technical workforce generally, and as such deserve consideration on a national scale. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to share a story with the committee. At the end of April, after our committee presented its report to NASA, the agency announced the winner of its astronaut glove challenge. The winner was Mr. Peter Homer. NASA used this new and non-traditional approach to acquire a hardware design that will eventually improve the ability of our astronauts to work in space. But this is not simply a story about new equipment or an innovative approach to finding new ideas, one that our committee, in fact, endorses. It turns out that Mr. Homer is unemployed and actually left the field of aerospace engineering many years ago to work as a sales manager in the computer industry. Indeed, this is a frequent aspect of the aerospace workforce as shown. If I could have the first figure, please. Do I activate this or does somebody else do it? Can I have that first figure, please? This is uh, some data that we got from NSF and pertains to the year 2003. As you can see, of the roughly 200,000 people that Blue Suit who are currently working in the aerospace and space science arenas, only 40% of them have degrees in those areas. You can't see it. I can see it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't see it. Dr. Black, why don't you continue? I'll just continue. We'll, uh, we will, uh, this, will be, we'll, we, this will be included in the record, and uh, we'll do our best. Here we go. Very good. Here Thank you. Go. Uh, the blue area, as I say, has roughly 200,000 people, and those are the ones currently working. Only 40 percent of them actually have degrees in that area. Another point to make here is that the NASA civil service workforce comprises only 10 percent of that, that area. 
Moreover, fully 75% of the people with degrees in aerospace and space science are not currently working in this area, people like Mr. Homer. The point here is that one needs to take care in interpreting the many numbers floating around in terms of how many skilled workers truly are available for these kinds of activities. One of the main themes of our report is the need for hands-on training for NASA's workforce, particularly in the areas that are key to achieving its programs on schedule and on budget. The committee recognized that two skills are, are areas are important not only to NASA, but to the national security space programs. These are systems engineering and program project management. Those skills cannot simply be produced in a classroom. They must be acquired over time. Just as a baseball player cannot become proficient by seeing the game explained on a blackboard, a systems engineer cannot become proficient at his job without building and integrating a spacecraft. But also, just as baseball players do not immediately head to the major leagues without first graduating from little leagues through the farm systems up to the majors, a systems engineer or program manager must also start small and gain experience. Unfortunately, the opportunities for gaining this kind of experience are, are missing. If you look at the following figure, that shows the kind of opportunities for hands-on experience by graduate students in Earth and Space Sciences over the years. And as you can see, they've been diminishing. That shows both sounding rockets, airborne, opportunities, balloons, and spacecraft. And, and the aggregate, as well as any to the individual elements of that graph, are all been decreasing drastically over the years. In closing, I'd like to return to the third aspect of our conclusions. My experience as a former NASA employee and as the president of a not-for-profit association of 100 universities working with NASA is that the agency has a tendency, has tended to deal with problems in relative isolation of other entities, a reflection of the can-do attitude of the Apollo era as well as a bit of the not invented here syndrome. The committee feels that NASA workforce issues are a microcosm of a broader set of national concerns and that solutions are best sought in the context of what the committee refers to as the aerospace eco ecosystem shown here. NASA is a relatively small player in this ecosystem. As I said earlier, the civil service makes up only 10% of the total workforce. And it therefore seems that it would do better to work with other elements in defining and understanding the key issues and then arriving at a solution that is in everyone's best interest. In this way, NASA would be able to leverage its concerns off of those of the larger inhabitants of the ecosystem. That concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for your interest in this important topic. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Black, and we worked through the audiovisual uh, uh, glitch, and, it, and th that's important data. We'll put that in the record. Dr. Stone, five minutes uh, is yours, and welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Udall and Ranking Member Hall, for providing the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, NASA's largest federal employee union, the opportunity to present our perspective on the workforce challenges facing NASA today. IFPT's primary interest in testifying is to provide advocacy for maintaining the technical excellence and independence of NASA's civil service workforce. However, our interests extend more broadly to a deep commitment to NASA's success, not only in the near term, but more importantly in the long term, consistent with the true spirit of the vision for space exploration. NASA is not facing a workforce crisis. It is facing a fiscal crisis. The President's vision outlines a bold and ambitious set of milestones, yet NASA is not being given a bold and ambitious budget needed for success. As long as the vision remains largely an unfunded mandate, all of NASA's missions and its workforce will remain at risk, and that is the primary issue. The last time a president asked NASA to send humans to the moon, NASA had nearly 36,000 civil servants on board and an annual budget of more than $30 billion adjusted for inflation, and we were not being asked to fix design problems with the shuttle or to build a space station at the same time. Yet today, NASA's civil service workforce has been halved and its budget reduced by more than 40 percent until the fundamental discrepancy between mission, budget, mission and budget is corrected, NASA's problems cannot be properly solved. First slide, please, or the only slide, please. A workforce demographic problem is readily apparent in Figure 2-2 of the NRC report. The real problem is the five-fold reduction in the 30 to 34-year-old range between 1993 and 2005, indicated by the vertical blue arrows on the left, a five-fold reduction. Management, however, remains obsessed with the faux problem of the right-hand tail of the distribution to the right of the vertical red line, which represents only about 5% of the workforce and has been stable for more than a decade, yet there is where they keep pounding to reduce it. 
IFPTE applauds the National Research Council for its thoughtful analysis and recommendations on NASA's workforce plan. The report recognizes the immediate need to engage aggressively in the education, the hands-on training, and recruitment of the next generation of NASA employees. IFPT, however, is disappointed with the National Academy of Public Administration's report as it fails to question management's assertions. It accepts as fact uncertain and mistaken premises that NASA's budget will not grow, that its current employee skills are seriously mismatched with NASA's new mission, and thus that NASA must reduce its science, aeronautics, and technology development activities and workforce. We fundamentally disagree. IFPT, however, continues to support the 10 Healthy Centers philosophy in initiated by Dr. Griffin, and we reject the criticism of that plan in the NAPA report. We encourage Dr. Griffin to persevere in his efforts to decentralize the Constellation program. Unfortunately, current policies continue to severely stress NASA's research centers. The solution should not be and cannot be to convert them into mini operational centers or to subject them to some BRAC-like process. Rather, the revitalization of cutting-edge R&D at the field centers is crucial for the safe and meaningful return to the moon, as well as for delivering on our promises in science and aeronautics. To reinvigorate NASA's workforce in support of all of its missions, and to maintain America's prestige and leadership in science and aerospace R&D, IFPTE offers the following seven recommendations. First, Congress should fund NASA at close to the authorized level as possible and prohibit transfer authority across major accounts. IFPT proposes at least an additional $300 million for science, $420 million for exploration systems, $200 million for aeronautics, $30 million for education, and $50 million for critical facilities over the President's FY08 proposal. Second, Congress should, per should preserve the technical excellence and independence of NASA's civil service workforce. NASA should fund civil servant salaries directly to the centers, independent of programs, to allow for the effective use of matrix management and to end the scapegoating of civil service employees. Third, NASA should provide stability for its current workforce to reassure its future workforce. The administrator should publicly reject any use of RIFs so that the best and the brightest young engineers and science graduates can once again see NASA as a great career move. Fourth, NASA, uh, IFPT supports the NRC recommendations. NASA must begin an aggressive campaign to recruit young employees while the current staff is still on board to transfer its critical knowledge. Fifth, IFPT strongly opposes three of NAPA's recommendations. IFPT opposes any authorization to use a BRAC lice process to close centers, any streamlining of the RIF procedures, and any authority to unilaterally terminate retirement eligible employees. Sixth, IFPT supports enhancing voluntary buyout authority. Uh, we support the post-employment extension of medical coverage and an increase in the buyout incentive up to an individual's severance pay capped at one year's salary. Seven, IFPT strongly opposes any new authority to facilitate the conversion of permanent positions to term positions, and therefore we oppose the administration's proposed term conversion, uh, conversion legislation. In closing, IFPT is very grateful for the bipartisan congressional rescue that has thus far protected NASA's workforce from a misguided RIF. Let us now turn to the era of workforce, from the era of workforce damage control to a more positive era of rebuilding NASA's future workforce. Once again, Chairman Udall and Ranking Member Hall, IFPT thanks you for inviting us to bring these important issues to the attention of the subcommittee. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Uh, at this point, let's uh, uh, open up our first round of questions, and the chair will recognize himself uh, for five minutes. Uh, I direct my first round of questions to Dr. Black and uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Ms. Dossie's testimony notes that uh, to a large degree these reports, and that is the National Academies and the NAPA reports, uh, confirm our assessments of the challenges facing us in the workforce arena and validate the actions that we have initiated to address the most critical and encompassing issues. Do you agree with NASA's response to the findings and recommendations of these reports? And if not, which of your recommendations do you think need the most attention uh, by NASA? And Dr. Stone, let's uh, start with you, and then uh, then we'll move to uh, uh, Stuart. And then if Ms. Dossie uh, has, if there's time left, we'll give you a chance to hear your point of view. So, Dr. Stone. So, um, 
your your question is how what do I think of NASA's response to these reports? Yes, yeah, the, and uh, if you uh, don't agree with all of them or most of them or some of them, uh, which of the, your recommendations do you think uh, need most attention by NASA? Okay, uh, I would say that NASA has indeed um, basically, uh, except for the most extreme proposals at the end of the NAPA report that I would like to address separately, um, the NAPA report basically is just a, a, um, a rubber stamping of the uh, approach that NASA has been taking of, of um, trying to uh, realign its workforce um, through a process that largely involves the flexibility to um, enhance attrition and to reduce the civil service complement. And I think there's, there is a strange mixture in the goals of NASA's management between trying to adjust with, to the real goal of the vision and trying to implement a, um, a, a uh, civil service reshaping that involves uh, a reduction of several thousand employees. And I think the latter is a political decision that isn't linked to any, any reality to the vision. And so there is some schizophrenia to their response in that um, uh, some of it is addressing real issues and some of it is, is, is really just addressing that what seems to be a predetermined goal to reduce the civil service complement. As far as the um, NRC report, um, I don't see much of a response at all uh, to what they've suggested. Uh, and indeed, they seem to be continuing to shrink their education budget, continu continuing to reduce efforts to, um, to uh, bring in young people. Um, and, and in my longer uh, testimony, there's a quote from uh, – the administrator on this uh, that I think is really telling. And uh, there was a question asked at an all-hands meeting at Ames uh, a few months ago by, uh, by a very prominent scientist. And the scientist asked, what is NASA doing to recruit young people, which is the largest uh, effort in the NRC um, recommendations. And the administrator's response was, I cannot grow the agency by bringing in even all-stars right now that I want to bring in unless and until folks like us who, as you said, are getting older, until and unless these folks retire. And, and indeed, um, I'm, I don't think this is official policy, but I think there is a, a, a quota of three to one where centers are not allowed, to, the research centers are not allowed to hire someone until three people retire. And so I think that there is a fundamental resistance from, the, um, uh, from management to actually seriously take on the question of solving that five-fold reduction in the younger employees. And on one side, I, I find that reprehensible, and on the other side, I, I, it's understandable. It comes back to the point that I said at the beginning. There isn't enough money for uh, Dr. Griffin to uh, meet all the challenging needs of Constellation and also rebuild the workforce. And he's choosing to meet the short-term milestones of Constellation and leave the workforce rebuilding problem to his successor. And he's doing so, I believe, not because he wants to, but because he is not being given adequate budget to do it right. Thank you, Dr. Sean. I'm going to try and give Dr. Black a minute or okay, so sorry. here to respond, and then we'll, we'll – in the next round, I'll uh, give Mr. Stewart and Ms. Dossie a chance as well. Thank Dr. you, Chairman. Um, the problem of the workforce is a daunting one, and I think NASA has made at least good initial strides in trying to, uh, to deal with this. This has been pointed out by Dr. Stone. Uh, our committee's concerns as regards young people and fresh hires, I think that they have not yet done all that well there. One of the things to understand is this is a very, very difficult problem. If you look at the kind of curve that Dr. Stone showed, one of the things that I think NASA has not done is to characterize its people both by the true level of their experience, their expertise, they count belly buttons and bins by job categorization, but not whether they really have the skills necessary. Uh, and the other thing that's really crucial in a strategic sense is to understand the dynamics of that curve. What are the sources and sinks? How do you adjust? How, over what time scales? Different things have different time scales. Graduate students have certain time scales. Industry has time scales. So I think they really need somebody, and I don't believe this expertise exists in the agency. Uh, we did a modest search. We were unable to find things, but I'm sure somebody in the university community knows how to do this, to really understand what are the forces that shape and evolve that, that curve that, that Dr. Stone showed. And I think essentially you're going to have to have that if you're going to truly have a strategic plan to deal with workforce issues. Thank, thank you, Dr. Black. And uh, at this time I'll recognize uh, member, uh, Mr. Hall for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dossie, it seems to me that we 
all agree on uh, that NASA's workforce is likely to face some changes. We expect that. That's taken. Uh, in order to meet new goals that we have in exploration, science, and aeronautics. And NASA sent us a workforce strategy over a year ago, and I presume that you've been busy over the past year trying to implement some of this strategy. Uh, I think that's a good presumption. Uh, would you please give me some specifics about what NASA is doing to bring its workforce into appropriate alignment to meet our exploration, uh, science, and aerial goals, and specifically, uh, to answer the in-house problems as set out by Dr. Black. Yes, sir. We have been working very hard over the past year to implement the workforce strategy. It, the workforce strategy is still current. What we have done is we've developed a comprehensive implementation plan. And that implementation plan, as I said, is worked around three goals. And one of them is workforce planning. Over the past year, we have set up a government structure, governance structure, which includes human capital, as I believe Mr. Stewart recommended, in all of the workforce planning decisions, along with other key officials in the agency. We've also set up in that governance structure a standing workforce planning team, technical team, that includes human capital and workforce planning, workforce transition staff from around the agency. And we have specific sub-teams that will address specific issues, for example, for any skill mix issues or the shuttle transition. Uh, we have a, a team set up to do the mapping of shuttle employees from shuttle to Constellation. In terms of alignment, we have redesigned our leadership development programs. Basically what we're working on is, while our entry-level pipeline is getting some criticism here this morning, we do have that pipeline. We have students, co-op students at NASA. We have about 400 of them at any given time. We also have over 400 graduate students working on NASA projects. The other part of the alignment, though, is to make sure, as also was suggested this morning, that we have program managers, project managers, senior technical, and senior executive service pipelines. And so we're building career paths and training programs that start fairly early in our employees' career and give them experiences needed not only to build within their own career, but to understand NASA as a whole, both the program side of the house and the institution side of the house. And finally, we're, we have taken our systems that have been operating pretty much independently of one another, the systems that would inform our leadership, and we're integrating them so that they have all the workforce data they need, all the demographic data they need to make decisions for the workforce. Well, I, I thank you for that. So of your NASA workforce strategy, uh, the 10 healthy centers, I think uh, the administrator pretty well put that to bed. Uh, yes. That uh, there's talk of closing them at one time, and maybe some others on here think that might be the thing to do. But I think he's taking a pretty firm position on that, and I think a lot of us up here recognize how very capable he is. The second one is to maximize the existing workforce, as you've pointed out there, and I, I think we have to do that. And, and third, then, uh, you said three goals, and is the third one to evolve to more flexible civil service by, in your workforce, you pointed out the temporary people that you were using and how many different universities they were from. Does that kind of summarize what the three that you said, or have I left out something? No, those are the three. All right. I think my time's almost up, and I yield back, and I do thank all four of you. Thank you, Dr. Black. Thank you, uh, Judge Hall. And uh, at this point, uh, yield uh, five minutes, recognize for five minutes the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, first of all, let me ask Mr. Stone and uh, Dr. Stone, uh, uh, you made suggestions about spending large amounts of money. Uh, just to us where that money will be coming from? Um, 
First of all, I don't think they're large amounts of money that we're talking about asking uh, for a plus. Anytime you talk about over $100 million, it's a lot of money. Okay. But um, where is it, it supposed to come from? The, the, where do you want, you, want to, you want to take it from the military? You want to take it from uh, 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 health research? Uh, to be taken seriously, when someone testifies here nowadays, you can't just come up and say you want to spend hundreds of millions of more dollars here, hundreds of millions of dollars more there, and just expect we're going to come up with it like the tooth fairy is going to deliver it. You want to be taken seriously like any engineer, you have to know that you can't build something out of nothing. So where do you want to get that money? With all due respects, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm asking you a specific question. You can, you can uh, the numbers that we quoted there, respect. the numbers that we quoted there, were right out of the authorization bill. The authorization bill was passed almost unanimously by both sides of Congress. Well, fine. And so I didn't invent that. Fine. I but second, I will have to tell you that I disagree with quite often when the, when this Congress irresponsibly authorizes money and doesn't say where it's coming from. You're an engineer. Where do you want us to take it from? Well, you mentioned the military. The military has well over $22 billion okay. for its space research program. A lot of the constellation efforts okay. are efforts that could be leveraged by the military. Indeed, when the shuttle is gone, um, satellites are going to need to be repaired in different ways. And I would think that a lot of the technology that would be developed under the constellation program would be dual use. And so it would not be unfair to leverage okay. some of those funds. All right. That's a good answer. That's what I was looking for. So you think that we can actually find more funds by finding by looking into what is now in the DOD budget and either rechanneling re them or leveraging them and, and making sure that uh, they, they pick up some of the costs for what we want to do on the NASA side? Is that what we're talking about? Th that was one suggestion. Um, the, the, the bottom line question, though, is if you ask NASA to do something, then you have to pay for it. So if you're not going to give us the billion dollars, then you have to decide what we're not going to do. And uh, I agree with that as well. But uh, let, let's just note that when people are advocating that we're going to end up spending so much more money, it's got to come from somewhere. And almost, you know, in my 18 years here, uh, at least the Democrats now are suggesting that we have pay go. We've got to know where the money's coming from in order to advocate something. And uh, I think to be taken seriously, and, I, and the suggestion you just gave, I think it's a good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Um, let me note that uh, uh, when we're talking about the uh, workforce and uh, future workforce, which you also stressed, uh, we should be, uh, I think NASA should be focusing more, although we just heard the testimony that there are 400 uh, interns. Uh, uh, there are 400 cooperative program interns at NASA. Right. Uh, it would seem to me that, we, that, that there should be more than that. That's a, that's a very cost-effective program. Uh, we've, we've passed scholarship concepts here, where, uh, which I've pushed for over the years, to try to target those people who are getting their education who may not be able to afford it unless we help them. Uh, the scholarship programs, internships, and apprentice programs, these are all things that I think are very cost-effective that uh, uh, should address some of the concerns of Mr. Stone and others that have uh, testified today. Uh, let me note that for a long time, I was here, I've been in this committee now for 19 years, and for at least uh, 15 of those years, we were begging for a space strategy, and no president gave it to us except this president. And I have my differences with this president on a number of issues, uh, but I will suggest that he did give us a space strategy. He wants us to focus on the moon. He came up forward. Back to the moon is the primary mission. And if we now know that that's the space strategy, we all were begging for one, shouldn't NASA be restructured so that it meets that strategy as its primary goal? And you're not going to do it by keeping NASA exactly the same number of, uh, you know, uh, of, of employees, exactly the same number of centers. Uh, there has to be a prioritization in order to meet a goal. We finally have somebody set a goal, uh, and uh, I would suggest that uh, we're going to have, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would suggest that we're going to have to do uh, some serious reform if we are to suggest to the people that we are serious. You know, if I just asked Mr. Stone to be serious about it, give us an example. We've got to prioritize as well, and uh, we've, we've accepted the space strategy. Let's get to work on it. And I'm very, very pleased that Mr. Finney is going to be uh, 
ranking member and working with you, uh, Chairman Udall, and you can count on my uh, active support to try to make sure we reach that goal, back to the moon, set that strategy, uh, as the President has, and do the things that are necessary to responsibly reach those goals. Other goals have to be secondary, and it might mean closing some of the centers and letting some of the people go, uh, mainly because you can't, as you say, you've got to spend money. The money hasn't been allocated, so let's spend the money that we've got wisely to achieve the specific goals that have been set by the President, and, uh, and I might say uh, approved by Congress. So with that said, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Rohrbacher, and uh, for your spirited uh, interchange with the panel. I, I would acknowledge uh, and point out that all of us uh, on the committee uh, know that uh, we have to find some additional resources, and we're working in a bipartisan way to do so. At this point, I want to yield Mr. to Mr. Chairman, could just one note, is yes. finding additional resources or making the system more efficient? I, yes. uh, my opinion would be we, we need to do both. Uh, Thank you for that, uh, that question, uh, Congressman Moorbacher. At this point, I want to yield to Judge Hall. We want to start the clock for a special announcement uh, and acknowledgement. Uh, Judge Ms. Hall. Mr. Chairman and members of, on both sides of the docket, I'm honored to say that when Ken Calvert was moved to approach, uh, it meant that we selected from among our group uh, one to be ranking with you, Mr. Chairman, here. And the selection has been made to Mr. Feeney. He represents the Kennedy area. and is a very great supporter and very knowledgeable about space and aeronautics. And I, I think uh, to demonstrate that I recognize him, that I'll abandon this area and let him come on and take my place, and I'll go about looking for another job somewhere. <laughs> Yield back. Thank you, uh, Congressman Hall and uh, this Congressman Feeney moves over here. I'll filibuster for a minute uh, or so before I recognize uh, Congressman Feeney. I would, I would tell you that, uh, as uh, Judge Hall mentioned, Congressman Calvert has taken an important uh, position on the Appropriations Committee. He's, uh, I'm sure, committed to all of us that he'll take this particular committee's interest to heart uh, on the Appropriations uh, Committee. But I feel like we've uh, actually uh, generated a dual benefit because as Congressman Calvert moves to the Appropriations Committee, we've now have a new ranking member, Mr. Feeney from Florida, who represents the Kennedy Space Center, and I know will be a strong advocate for all things NASA. I had a chance to get to know Congressman Feeney a little bit better when we traveled together last summer uh, to see the uh, new uh, series of shuttle launches. We, we, as we often do as members of Congress, jinx the uh, launch uh, for that particular day. But those of you who remember the narrative, the, the shuttle uh, was launched on the 4th of July, which was very appropriate, and I know uh, Mr. Feeney was one of the proud uh, observers that day. So, Congressman Feeney, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to working with you. Welcome uh, as the new ranking member of the committee, and uh, the floor is yours uh, to uh, uh, provide questions to the panel and to make any comments you'd like to make. Well, well thank you, uh, Chairman. I'm really honored. I'm especially honored that uh, my friend uh, Ralph Hall would uh, ask me to, uh, to take this position. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a real estate lawyer by background. I don't know much about science or, or space. I've got a lot of people in my district that do, including my, my wife, who spent about two decades as an engineer for a major contractor at Kennedy Space Center. And I like to point out that um, my political adversaries uh, regularly say I'm no rocket scientist, and that's true, but I'm, I'm married to one who's or she's pretty close anyway, and that's about the, the best I can do. But uh, having said that, I appreciate the, the chairman's leadership, and I agree with him that we're going to need both more resources and more efficient use of, of our resources. And I think that's, a, that's an attitude that the both of us uh, uh, share, and I'm very excited about pursuing ways, uh, ways to do that. Uh, I'm particularly interested in some of the criticism of um, – of the strategy that Ms. Dossi has laid out today, and I think there's a lot of good things in it, but some of the criticism focuses, and I think uh, Congressman Rohrbacher mentioned it, on a lack of an aggressive enough plan for young people. And I should share with you that along with uh, Mark Kirk and Rick Larson, I was the first American allowed to see the Chinese civil space uh, launch facility in Zhogan, uh, and that was uh, a year and a half ago. And one of the remarkable things about what the Chinese are doing is that they are having young people develop a next-generation rocket. Uh, what they admitted to us, and of course, all of their program is in their military budget, and they, 
intentionally obfuscate what they're doing, but they admitted that they have over 100 university centers working on things involved in future space uh, issues, whether it's creating robots to explore the moon, uh, whether it's uh, different types of technology. And one of my concerns is, uh, and I think Dr. Black had a great anal analogy, no matter how talented you are, you can't walk onto a baseball field. I mean, try explaining the rules of baseball to a foreigner. Uh, it's almost impossible, and it takes time to understand the rules, let alone develop the specific skills. And I am concerned. Uh, Dr. Stone, I think, pointed out with the retirement uh, that we're facing, uh, I'm very concerned that we do not have the um, long-term plan in place to attract the young people that we're going to need to maintain space predominance. And failure to maintain space predominance is simply not an option. Uh, we don't know what the Chinese long-term intentions are, for example, but we cannot permit uh, space predominance uh, on anybody other that even potentially could be hostile to peaceful uh, interests. And uh, I, I, I think it's very important. Dr. Black, would you elaborate, uh, because you talk about the, the, way, the fact that we ought to visualize the workforce as more than just the 80,000 people that are working directly in aerospace and also trained in aerospace, but we've got a much larger pool, DOD, aerospace industries. Can you give us some idea how we can better uh, use the available pool today, but also develop a larger pool for tomorrow of young people? Well, there's, there actually is a, as, you, as you're well aware, I'm sure, there's the Interagency Aerospace Workforce Revitalization Task Force Act, which is uh, you, you've been involved with. And that's, I believe, a, a term thing that is involved, focuses strictly on government entities. One thing I would encourage you to do is to try and broaden that. The, the ecosystem that we talk about includes not only the government, but also the university community uh, as well, and the, and the private sector, the contractors. And it, it's in that context that I think the solution uh, must be sought in terms of how to balance, move, have flexibility for the overall aerospace workforce. I would say that if you take your, your point on China, I think China now is much like it was when I was a kid beginning of the Apollo, giving my age away. Uh, it, it's you mean much like we were? Uh, much like, right. right. And it was, I think that it's one thing to maintain existing space capabilities. It's another thing to have young people actually develop new Well, new that's right. And I think the enthusiasm, what the Chinese youth are probably seeing now is much what the youth of America saw in the late 50s and early 60s. I can tell you, their taekwondots are heroes over oh, there. You bet. They are you bet. And so, I, and I think that's one of the things we have lost. If you, as we listened to various witnesses that came before us in our committee, one of the things that emerged is that uh, NASA is no longer the place necessarily where the people in universities are recommending their best students go. And in fact, many of the best students no longer do go there. And one of the reasons for that is programs take so much longer. Uh, you look at what's happened with, uh, I was the first chief scientist for the space station program. I came here in 1985 for that function in 1197 tell you where we are on that right now. So that's the kind of thing that if you're, if you're today's youth, and by the way, today's youth, I think, is a professor at, at Rice University, uh, our, my experience and my colleagues' experiences are that they're much more oriented towards quick return. Uh, they, they're not as career-oriented uh, as, as many of us were. So I think the, the ability to attract young people is a much more difficult challenge and to keep them in the workforce than it was when, when we were growing up. Um, but I think it's important to do that, and, and Ms. Dorsey points out the 400 kids working. The problem is many of those are associated with what is truly the, the sort of crown jewel of NASA, the science programs. They're very excited. They come over, and that's great. I don't think that should be discouraged, but the shortage that the committee noticed was more in the systems engineering project and program management, and there are very few programs that NASA has to bring youth in those areas. They're very strong in the science areas, but not so strong in those areas. So I think if they're going to truly address the shortages that they have, they need to pay more attention to that aspect as well. Thank you, Congressman Feeney. Thank you, Dr. Black. I, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, a uh, contributing and a very engaged member of the committee has joined us, uh, Mr. Melanson from Louisiana. I know at this time he doesn't have any questions, wants to learn from the panel. So at this uh, time, I'll recognize uh, the member from Alabama, Mr. Bonner, and we all uh, envy uh, the Alabama's delegation's mm -hmm. commitment to aerospace and aeronautics and the tremendous set of facilities and operations they have down there. So, Congressman Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of the panel members. I I'm going to give you an unscripted question because a lot of times we get questions given to us that uh, we think we need to put on the record. 
But as a nation, we have often looked to our president or to the head of NASA or other leaders in the field to set out a vision. And I think it's safe to say that each of the four of you have a passion for NASA and have a passion for the mission of NASA. Uh, but as President Kennedy in the 1960s and as other presidents in uh, more recent years have done, in, in describing their vision of where they would like NASA to be in the 10, 20, 15, 10, 15, 20 years in front of us, where would you like to see NASA be? If you differ from what Congressman Rohrbacher indicated, President Bush's mission of taking us back to uh, the moon and possibly on to Mars, where, where would you like, and this is not a loaded question, I'd just like to know from your experience, where would you like to see NASA go in the next 20, 30 years? And it's open to all four of you. Well, I would, I think, in fact, um, I think that the vision that President Bush set out is a pretty good one. And it's a very challenging one. I mean, we, we've been talking uh, this morning as though this is going to be a piece of cake. Well, I mean, given the, um, given the, the realities of the budget situation that, that the Congress faces, and, um, and given the realities of the existing NASA workforce, and given the fact that one of the first things that, um, Administrator uh, Griffin mentioned when he took responsibility for that position that he wanted to he wanted to bring their core responsibilities back into NASA. He wanted NASA to have the expertise and the experience to take charge of developing the various elements that are going to be needed for the uh, to, to achieve the vision. And that and that was exactly the right thing to say. I mean, that was precisely on target, but it laid out a very daunting uh, agenda because the fact is, and I think both our reports uh, uh, indicate that, the, the expertise and, and, the, and, and, the, and the technical uh, uh, expertise that, that is needed to do that does not currently exist in NASA to the degree that it needs to if they're going to accomplish it. So that's why this workforce thing is so um, Important, but I and so it is a it is a challenging vision that the president has set out, and it's one that I think as it, uh, I mean, the, you know, the shuttle has been, um, in many ways, a real triumph, in many ways, a great tragedy, but because it never really went anywhere, you know, it just around in circles, so to speak, it didn't have quite the same um, excitement associated with the Apollo program. Well, that's not that's going to change now. And I think when we're actually another couple of years down the road and the young people of this country see, in fact, that we're going to go back to the moon, I think there's going to be a lot of them are going to get very excited about that, as they did before. And, uh, and I, I certainly hope that that is what happens. I think it will. Uh, and uh, uh, that's – if we could achieve that, I would think we would be cheap. And don't forget, he's, the vision includes not stopping at the moon. And so if you really take that seriously, you have really got yourself an agenda. Congressman, I agree with Mr. Stewart. I think that the vision set before us is an exciting vision, and it is where NASA should go. I would like to say that our administrator, Mike Griffin, it has, is doing his best to carry out that vision. He has reorganized NASA back to the, the, almost to look like the organization under, during the Apollo era. And we are all tasked. Mike Griffin has spoken very directly, as you, many of you may know. He's a very open, direct person, and he has told us what he expects of us. And yes, it is a daunting challenge, and, but I really feel convinced that NASA is doing everything it can, given what people are calling challenges in terms of budget and FTE. But what we have done in the past year is remarkable. In terms of workforce planning, for example, I've talked about a governance structure, but we took 75 separate systems just in HR that didn't talk to one another, and we pulled them together to give the leadership an idea of who's working on what and, and when and where. We have a competency management system that now is loaded with personal competencies as well as posi position competencies, and they are validated by supervisors or expert panels. 
That system is married now with a workforce, implement, implement, workforce information management system to show the CMS shows supply, the workforce information management system shows demand, and together they are showing us where our gaps and surpluses are so that we can start building recruitment programs around those. The other that we're doing in terms of setting, making sure we're moving quickly enough and in the right direction is we have mapping plans of shuttle to Constellation. So again, we're watching that, that workforce. And while we don't have, we have ceiling restrictions, when, when I mentioned that we had 400 cooperative education students in NASA, they're across all centers. They're in science and engineering. And that where the, most of the science funds are going are to the graduate students. And yes, most of the money for the graduate student program is uh, science. The, the other part of the, the problem is we do have a workforce that's been at NASA a long time. People love NASA. It's an exciting place to work. They come to work there, and it's their career. They're not looking to move on. The newer generation might be, but our experience so far is they want to be there. So we are putting in place really serious retraining programs. We are developing program project management training programs. We have engineering programs going. We are sending people to colleges and universities as well as doing internal training. We are, we have realized that that we used to be 10 centers and we realized that we need to be one NASA and Mike Griffin is really pushing that. So when we look at the exploration program, if work can be done at other centers, the work goes there. And NASA has educated, intelligent engineers and scientists in all 10 of those centers. And so we've been really, really successful. Two years ago, we had over 2,000 unfunded FTE. We had that down to 200 now because we have moved work judiciously. And we have reassigned people. We've offered buyouts and early outs to allow us to, to recruit. And over 1,300 people have left uh, because we, we had that flexibility. It, it's, it's, it, it's very difficult to explain how all of this is coming together, working very hard on the institution side of the house to support the program side of the house. And there are a lot of ex exciting activities going on. We also have updated Ms. our- Ms. Dossi, if I, if I might, uh, gentlemen's time's expired and, and I appreciate your passion for the subject. Uh, and if the other witnesses would like to comment for the record on the question that Mr. Bonner directed, uh, we'd be happy to accept those comments. Uh, I wanna make a comment and make an acknowledgement uh, before we uh, recognize uh, Dr. Wu. Uh, Congressman Bonner talked about unscripted remarks. He's now in a very exclusive uh, group because uh, Congressman Warbacher never makes scripted remarks uh, to, his, to his great credit. Um, I did want to acknowledge we were talking about heroes in the Chinese society, and we've just been joined by a true American hero. That's uh, Buzz Aldrin is here uh, sitting on the front row. We want to acknowledge a, a great Buzz Aldrin. Thank you. Thank you for your service and your example, and uh, we're honored to have you here, sir. Uh, I'd uh, be uh, honored to uh, uh, yield five minutes uh, to Congressman Wu. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks for making me a doctor. I've really disappointed my parents by not going down further down that road, uh, but uh, I'm making up for it today. Uh, Ms. Dossie, perhaps uh, I'll give you an opportunity to follow up on the, the answer that you were making. Um, and I'm, just, I'm asking this question just based on um, uh, anecdotal evidence, uh, personal experience of visiting three or four NASA centers and, and attending several lectures of folks who were with the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. And these were active participants. If you did the arithmetic, you sort of thought, oh my gosh, you know, these are folks who were in their early to mid-30s when they were you know, in charge of major parts of the program. Uh, that's one uh, information set, if you will. And then during my walkthroughs, and this could be anecdotal and not accurate, uh, it could be uh, because of the people I was with and what I was looking at, 
but it sure seemed to me like, and I hate to use the term old, um, because these were folks about my age, uh, maybe slightly older, maybe slightly younger, but there were a whole bunch of folks uh, who were sort of longer in the tooth like me, um, then coming to the younger age groups, there seemed to be a, a precipitous dive down statistically. And then as you get to the youngest of the professional groups uh, or uh, out in the um, assembly areas, there might be a little blip of younger people. But there seemed to be um, a real collection of people at the older end of the spectrum and then um, uh, at, at least a significant valley uh, of uh, uh, people in the in-between range and uh, a, a shortage of younger people. And I, and I just, w when I observed that, and this this was, you know, over a period of, of, of a few years and I have not been back uh, in the last 12 months or so, uh, at least there, uh, I have a concern in the back of my head about whether we have uh, the right, whether we will have the right personnel mix to accomplish the missions that have been set out for us. Uh, and it's not that you don't uh, learn a lot, get better at things as uh, one hopes uh, also as, uh, as one gets older. Uh, but I'm just wonder wondering about the age distribution of the workforce that we have today as compared to the early exploration phases uh, that NASA engaged in whether that has something to do with NASA budgets, whether that has something to do with uh, the competitive arena that you all are engaged in with the private sector or others. And I'd like to just turn it over to you and the rest of the panel to, uh, uh, to, to, to address that as best you can. Try to keep my response shorter. But the, one of the reasons that what you observed is, is true is NASA has always worked hard not to conduct reductions in force. And in the 90s, when there was the major downsizing across government, NASA attrited through national attrition and did not conduct reductions in force when most other government agencies did. So that's why you see that gap in the middle. As I said, when we are able to hire, we are trying to hire to fill that, to, to plan, do the succession management kind of hiring so that we have people who are filling in the middle group and, and, yeah, and bringing in younger students. We recognize we do have an issue and we're working to address it. The, the, one of the ways we're addressing it is we're having different, Constellation is relatively new and we are just finishing the systems requirements and the systems requirements reviews this month and we're going to do a program baseline synchronization following that. And that will show, give us a better idea of what the new requirements are for Constellation and where we need to direct our recruiting. And so that's another effort to, to know what kinds of skills and, and when we can start hiring to fill those skills, skill needs. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to uh, make a comment? Um, you're right about the age distribution and so on. It's, it's very striking. And um, a good part of this is due to the fact that in the 90s, there was a job freeze uh, in, in most areas of NASA. And it was, uh, uh, it was very difficult uh, to deal with that. And there weren't any fresh outs coming in in, in several of those years. Uh, I was on the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel in those years. And we wrote specific reports on the, on the safety implications of not having adequate workforce dealing with, this, with the space shuttle. And by it got to be 2000, 2001, those, the, those restrictions were relaxed and we could begin to hire young people and so on. But there, are, there is going on in NASA today, and we talk about it in our report, um, various experiments which are, which are very encouraging. The, um, um, let me see if I can get the right title on it, the Contracting Intern Program, which has been done in the Office of Procurement, to go out and find young people, bring them in, uh, circulate them around through the center so they don't get a headquarters mentality, has been very successful. Um, 
There are uh, a number of examples in other federal agencies, which we talk about in our report, that I think that I think NASA could could usefully uh, adopt, and not at any great additional funding. We're not, none of these are going to cost more money, but there are examples, and it's. I think the panel agrees. I don't agree with mo with much of what Dr. Stone said. Let me say, but I do agree that we got to get more young people in. Mr. Stewart, thank you. Uh, gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, we've just had a series of votes called, but I think we'll try and get uh, another round uh, from the chairman and from the ranking member, if you all would be willing to stay, uh, and then we'll have to adjourn the hearing. Um, Ms. Nossi, um, you've stated that NASA has a workforce implementation plan to accompany the workforce strategy. Does that plan have specific objectives, steps to achieve those objectives, specific milestones? and resource requirements, and if, if not, why not? And uh, would you please, uh, either way, provide uh, the implementation plan to the subcommittee? Yes, I, I think it's on, the, the implementation plan is on its way to the subcommittee if you don't already have it. We were, it was requested on Monday, so you may have it by now. The, work, the workforce implementation plan is com very comprehensive. I mentioned the three goals that we had, and each of those goals has three objectives, but the total is 150 tasks to implement the strategy. Does it have timetables and milestones? Yes, it has timetables and milestones, and we have an automatic tracking system, mm -hmm. and the automatic tracking sh system shows the, t the milestones, the metrics, timetables, and the leads. And it's, center, and it's agency-wide. We have some of our centers are some of the leads on the projects, on the tasks. Th thank you, and we look forward to reviewing uh, that plan when you send it over. Uh, Dr. Black, the uh, National Academy's report notes that uh, it is critical to maintain in-house scientific competence to provide leadership and to maintain expertise in specialty areas that are not broadly practiced in universities and industry. Would you elaborate on that point? You know, the the in-house scientists at NASA play a very special role. They uh, they provide the linkage with the project and the and the science objectives of the missions. Uh, they help translate the requirements. Uh, they're in a sense the guardians of the science as the, as the trades need to be made and as a mission goes forward. Um, and these are the kinds of activities that typically university people do not have the time or the inclination to stay involved with. So it's very important that NASA maintain a core scientific expertise with people who have the ability to work with the projects, work with the engineers, uh, to make sure that the projects are being done in a way that, that really realizes the scientific objectives that, that are set out. And so these are the kinds of skills, if I understand your question, that we think that it's important to maintain inside the, uh, the agency. Uh, if we, we did remark in our report that it would probably be worthwhile at least doing a head count and see whether, in fact, all of the scientists associated with NASA uh, need to still be involved that way. Uh, but that's, that's a separate issue. In the couple of minutes I have remaining, anybody else in the panel want to comment on that particular question? Mr. Stewart. Well, somewhere before the hearing is over, I want to just say clearly for the record that I think Dr. Stone has seriously mischaracterized the Napa report, and I take real exception to some of the things that he said. I just want to get that on the record. For example, nowhere in our report do we talk about BRAC commission. It just isn't there. I mean, we, we, talk, we talk about the fact that there ought to be a – there ought to be a um, – systematic methodology for looking at the centers, for matching the responsibilities of the centers to their workforce that they have, and providing the flexibility and tools that are necessary to, to, to get the uh, right people to the right place at the right time. Uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee, when they asked us to do this report, I don't think anticipated that we were going to come back to them and say, well, you know what, folks, what you need to do is appropriate more money. I don't think that was what they had in mind when they gave us that assignment. We're, uh, we didn't get into the issue of what the NASA budget ought to be. That was not our assignment. Our assignment was how do you make a flexible, scalable workforce a reality in NASA given the tasks that they have to accomplish and, uh, and, the, and the budget restraints that are part of their world. And we've attempted to do that. And if, if one reads the report carefully, you'll see we're saying you need data. You need data at the right places. You need data that's integrated. 
you need, you need mechanisms, and we provided several that will help you make sense out of that data. And then you need the tools that, that you can then act on that data. That's essentially what the report's all about. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. You can certainly submit additional testimony on that line of the thinking. I think we committee. will. Dr. Stone, you want to have yeah, the last 30 Just take seconds? the PDF file and do a search for BRAC. You'll find it. Let me at this time uh, to the gentleman from Florida for the final round of questioning. Uh, Mr. Feeney. Well, thank you. Again, I want to uh, thank uh, Chairman uh, Udall. And we have to run off, and we've got a series of about eight votes, so this will probably be the end so you guys can go to uh, lunch and we can get about our business. Um, I focused earlier on the um, – need to recruit youth, whether directly in NASA or DOD or the aerospace community that are excited about this. And now I want to address a question that uh, Dr. Stone has raised and, and Mr. Stewart has raised, and that's the question of what the proper balance is. I mean, the strategy that uh, Ms. Dossey described uh, talks about a more appropriate blend of permanent and non-permanent civil servants. And I guess I'd like very briefly, because we only have a few minutes, uh, I think I uh, know Dr. Stone's uh, uh, answer here, but I'd like to have the, uh, uh, maybe he can address this very quickly, but uh, then the others. What is the proper ratio? How do we determine that? And uh, for Ms. Dossey, who uh, I guess we'll let finish up, how has NASA gone to make these judgments and decisions about who ought to be permanent as opposed to who ought to be non-permanent civil servants? Dr. Stone, you want to start? Just briefly, uh, as I said at the beginning of my opening statement, there were, there were 36,000 uh, NASA civil servant employees the last time we went to the moon, and we went there successfully. And now we have uh, only 16,300 permanent full-time civil servants left. Um, and, and rather than exp give a long answer right now, I, I would just encourage the, uh, the subcommittee members to um, take a look at the Columbia Accident Investigation Board and their advice on this topic. Because I think there's a, there's a detailed analysis done by an objective panel about the role of, of over outsourcing um, technical responsibilities to the private sector and undermining the internal technical abilities of the agencies and that contribution to the Columbia disaster. And I think that analysis is thorough and that would give you an idea of what our concerns are. Um, I can't give you a magic number, but I think when you look at the situation today and you look at the graph that I showed you up there, uh, the, the biggest problem facing NASA today is not to reduce its civil servants' workforce. And so the obsession with this is a little bit troubling considering that's not what the big problem is. And, and secondly, um, in, in one of the responses made earlier by Mr. Stewart, he, he said that the problem of recruiting young people was only in the 90s. But if you take a look at the graph, um, half of that five-fold reduction in the employees between 30 and 35 was between 1993 and 2000, and the other half of it was between 2000 and 2005. So all I'm saying is we're not hiring young civil servants, and the few young civil servants that we are hiring, we're hiring into, into term positions, which are much less attractive than the positions that were open to young people when I was looking at the agency. We're running out of time very quickly. Uh, Dr. Black and Mr. Stewart. I just want to know if I get hazardous duty pay for sitting between these two. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't really have that much to add. I think it's the only thing I would say here is that um, do not fall into the trap of just looking at a simple curve or two and listening to numbers about how many are in this bin or in that bin. This is a far more complex issue than that. Uh, and to look at the dynamics of how you get people in, as I said earlier, to look at the differing time scales for the sources and sinks of these people, understanding the evolution of this workforce is a very, very daunting problem, and I don't think we have our arms anywhere near yet around how to, how to do that. Mr. Stewart? You, you can't give a, um, a precise ratio uh, off the top of your head. It is a position-by-position position decision that the, um, uh, the hiring authority has to make, and, and it's, it's the nature of the position, the nature of the responsibilities that person would hold, along with a number of other factors, and we have a very precise decision guide in our report that will help managers make that decision in a coherent, rational way. In some cases, 
term employee fits the position very well in other cases the term employee would not be a good decision and you have to but you have to make that in a kind of rational way and not just sort of grab something out of the air and what we've tried to do here is to provide a mechanism for doing that in a rational and coherent way and if that's done we think that the the actual ratio will take care of itself Ms. Dulce you got about 10 to 20 seconds <laughs> okay first of all using term appointments is not for the purpose of attriting civil servants the purpose of the term appointment is to look at work that's changing over the next 20 years and making sure as Mr. Stewart said that the position dictates the, the, the type of appointment. Term appointments are for two years. Initially, we can extend it up to six years, and with our new term flexibility, we can convert without further competition to permanent if we, in fact, still need the skills. Right now, we have a skills mix issue that using term appointments will help us prevent in the future. Thank you. Uh we are in a bit of a hurry, so you'll understand as we depart quickly. But I want to thank the panel particularly and for the very forthright and impassioned conversation we've had. And, Dr. Black, you can apply for hazard pay uh, at the site office. Uh, but I think what, what it's the center of this, we all care deeply about NASA. We have a passion for its future, and we also have great pride in what it's accomplished. And that's the point of the hearing, the point of your all's appearance. Uh, if there's no objection, the record will remain open for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the subcommittee may ask of you all the witnesses. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the hearing is now adjourned.